Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, another special stream for you. Uh, let us reason. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and with us here, our dear brother Sam Shamoun, and we have a treat for you. Uh, myself and Sam have been uh, doing these live streams on the uh, Church Fathers, and I myself am always interested on how the Church Fathers uh, interpreted or at least understood or taught uh, or even expressed um, uh, their uh, basically faith or belief in certain doctrines. And that's extremely important for us, and especially for someone uh, like me who come from an Islamic background where our Muslim friends always attacking Christianity and certain doctrines and claiming that so-and-so invented it later or so-and-so uh, is teaching it and it wasn't taught like this by Christ and uh, or the apostles. So we want to always focus on the early church and the early church fathers and Sam has been doing really a great job in doing so. So I'm praying and hoping that we will continue to do many such series. Uh, today, we will be talking about Christology and uh, Sam, of course, is gonna share with us which early church father he is going to focus on or at least start with. With that in mind, Sam, thank you so much, brother, uh, for uh, the hard work you do. And thank you for being here with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here, to be used of the Lord Jesus Christ to serve you. And I always do pray that the Lord Jesus will bless your ministry, bring you more subscribers, and fully support your ministry so that you can provide for your family the daily bread that you need to continue this work for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Though the Lord doesn't need anyone, the Lord Jesus has chosen out of his own free will to use his human creatures that he sanctifies by the spirit, washes, cleanses, purifies by his holy blood, the blood of the lamb, the Lord Jesus, so that we can be his arms, his feet, his mouthpiece. So I pray the Holy Spirit will fill us, will bless you, bless your ministry, fill me to serve you for the glory of Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit save us from error, from stammering, from confusion, from mistakes, to recall the facts perfectly and correctly, and not just recall the facts, but empower everyone to understand those facts and then live them out passionately for the glory of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit to show the Lord Jesus that we love him and we're not lip service. And may he heal us and save us and sanctify us and protect us from the evil one in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. in Jesus' name. Good to be with you, brother. It's been a rough day, a little agitated, but that's what it is. Satan's constantly attacking us like yesterday. I know that because of the medication you're taking you had to reschedule this so we need you to pray for all the brothers and sisters in the front line guys when we say it's spiritual warfare warfare you have to believe that because you believe in the bible and the bible is god's word and the bible is <clears throat> historically accurate and tells us the reality that we live in and the reality is there's a spirit realm in the spirit realm you have satan and evil spirits who do not sleep, who are constantly attacking the human vessels, the human instruments that the Lord Jesus is pleased to use to get us out of the picture, to cause us to lose our faith or to bring shame to the Lord Jesus. But we trust the Holy Spirit to fill us, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to shield us against Satan, that we never fail Jesus, but love Jesus even unto death, until the Lord Jesus returns. So this is why we're constantly being attacked. Like yesterday, our brother, because of the medication, could not do this dream. And today I'm under attack. So, brother, how can they pray for you before we begin the, the session? Because since your back surgery, and thank the Lord Jesus, it was successful, but they've gotten you on medication, and that's right. been affecting your physical strength. How can they pray for you? Because that's what Satan wants to do, to distract you from doing the work of the Lord. Uh, really just a prayer for focus, strength, and uh, like you said, brother, I mean, uh, spiritual attacks happen to all of us as believers, but when you're in ministry in the front line, like you, uh, like I'm humbly saying myself, even though I don't do half of what you guys do, um, it's uh, Satan is always, uh, you know, uh, people need to really understand that Satan treats every uh, believer in a, at a different manner. There are some, unfortunately, some believers well, actually, at, at some points, they become an agent for Satan yes. by distracting, by yes. attacking, by by uh, basically discounting the word of God. And I pray for those believers to really uh, get discipled, get deeper in the word of God. But then those who become more and more mature, they'll notice that Satan rolls up his sleeves and goes after them harder and harder and harder. And that's why we want prayers 
for all the saints and uh, for us as well. And, and indeed, brother, uh, the medication sometimes gets so uh, tiring, so fatiguing, if you wish, to the point that I have no energy. Yeah, yeah. May that may the Holy Spirit keep you energized. And today, Satan used, unfortunately, a Christian brother who loves the Lord Jesus to distract me, and I had to shut down my own live stream because <clears throat> I want us to focus and not be distracted. Because if you're not focusing, this is a warning to every one of you, and I say this in love: you're here because you want to learn, not here to socialize. That means you need to focus on what is being said and ask Holy Spirit to help you understand because Satan's going to bring people to distract you. And then you're going to engage in the comment section, meaning you're wasting our time. You're being rude and disrespectful to us. We're taking the time to serve you. And worse of all, you're disrespecting the Lord Jesus by not focusing because that's what Satan doesn't want you to do is focus. Focus. Because my new policy is on my station, if people are not focused and they allow these trolls to distract, I'm going to shut down and delete and I won't do the session because it's a disrespect. And we're in warfare and we need to be prayed up and we need to be ready for the battle. And we're not ready for the battle by putting our weapons down, our guards down and letting Satan to distract us. So in Jesus name, let us focus. May the spirit fill us with the joy of the Lord, the joy of our salvation. So we're going to talk today about the witness of the apostolic fathers. I sent the brother two links already in because we're on StreamYard. So in StreamYard, there's like about a 15 second delay. I'm going to have to do the exact time. I think it's 15 to 20 seconds where he says something, I say something. And by the time you hear it now here, for example, talk about distraction. This poor cat who wants love and affirm affirmation. Always when I'm sitting here, that's when the cat comes because that's where the cat tries to get my attention. But anyway, there's two articles I sent him. He's now sharing the link. All of these materials you're going to find on the blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I already have a whole slew of articles from the Church Fathers. What you need to do is you put in the search engine, Church Fathers Trinity, Church Fathers Deity Christ. You put Church Fathers Deity Christ or Church Fathers Trinity. I have posts where I take snippets because the writings of the church fathers have been translated in English and they're now available online for free on newadvent.org, just to name one of many sites. There are other sites that have them as well. But if you go to newadvent.org and you do church fathers, all of the church fathers that have been translated in English are there for free. In the late 90s, early 2000s, we had to buy the volumes. And each volume was around $30. And there is, I believe, at least from last, I recall, 28 volumes, perhaps even more, that I remember. Again, I'm going by memory. May the Lord Jesus save us from error and stammering and confusion. All of that is now online for free. You don't need to pay for anything. All you do is pay for internet. So what I did was I took these snippets from the writings of the church fathers, made them available in one post so that you don't have to go look for them it's there accessible. You have my permission. Take the material, upload them, translate them, but freely disseminate the material because we don't charge you. So as we give it to you freely, you pass it on freely. But please seek the face of the Holy Spirit to help you understand what you're reading, what you're seeing, what you're <clears throat> hearing. Because another way Satan will use you inadvertently without you wanting to be used. <clears throat> He's going to distract you where you don't understand what you just heard or read or saw. So that thinking you did, you now go and miscommunicate and misinform because then you're going to say things that we did not say or someone else didn't say. But because you were not focused and distracted, you misheard, misread. Now you're passing false information, misinformation. And may God save us from that. So we're going to focus today on the Apostolic Fathers, two in particular. In upcoming sessions, if the Lord is pleased to have us do more sessions. We'll look at other apostolic fathers. Who are the apostolic fathers? Now, the classification is done by scholars on the early church writers. Historians who have studied the church fathers with great depth, they break down the church fathers or the church writers in different periods. You have the apostolic fathers. Why are they called the apostolic fathers? These are those individuals whose writings... <clears throat> 
were composed right around the time of the apostles or shortly thereafter. These are the individuals who were disciples of the apostles or whose writings were written shortly after the apostles or during their lifetime. And so those apostolic fathers would be, now remember these names, Ignatius of Antioch, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp. There is a writing attributed to Barnabas called the Epistle of Barnabas. This too is called an apostolic father, even though no scholar thinks Barnabas wrote it. It's attributed to Barnabas, but he didn't write it. Now, because it's written, according to many scholars, the later part of the first century or early start of the second century, it's classified as falling under that period called the Apostolic Fathers. Because notice, if it's late first century, that means John was still alive when this was composed. If it's the start of the second century, John, the last of the apostles, entered glory to dwell in the presence of the Lord Jesus. So that's why it's called of an apostolic father's writing. So Epistle of Barnabas, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp. You have Clement of Rome and the Didache, Didache, Didache or Didascalia. May the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue and save me from stammering. I have our time speaking English and now... I have to remember these names and all these different expressions in different languages. We're going to focus on Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp. Now, let me give you their importance. Why are they important? Ignatius was a disciple of the apostles. He was a disciple of the apostle John. He knew the apostles. He met the apostles. He was instructed by the apostles and pointed by them. And he is the bishop of the church in Antioch. Syria. Now, why is that important? Because in Acts 11, 26, Acts 11, verse 26, Antioch, Syria was a hotbed for apostolic activity. Many of the apostles would go there and minister there, including Peter. But in Acts 11, 26, we're told Paul and Barnabas were there. And while they were there, God revealed to the apostles and the prophets, because if you go to Acts 11, 26 to 30, it says not only were there apostles there, there were also prophets that God was granting supernatural visions and dreams and inspiring miraculously by the Spirit with revelation along with the apostles that all Christians were bound to follow. So if you go to Acts 11, 26 to 30, the apostles were there, Paul and Barnabas, and prophets and one prophet in particular named Agabus, Agabus, everyone to pronounce his name, prophesied by the Holy Spirit there would be a great famine, and it took place. And it was there that the Holy Spirit revealed to the followers of Christ that they should be called Christians. Acts 11, 26, it says, there they were first called Christians. Now, side note, I used to hear from preachers that supposedly followers of Christ were called Christians by unbelievers, perhaps the pagans, by way of mocking them. Now, here's my challenge to every one of you, if you were taught that, because I was taught that. Be a good Berean, Acts 17, 10 to 11, specifically 11. It says the Bereans took whatever Paul told them, and they would go back to the scriptures to pour over the scriptures to see if what Paul said... <clears throat> was a conformity with the scriptures. And Luke praises them and says they were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. So be a good Berean. And also 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, Paul, exhorting us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, test all things, test everything, and hold fast to that which is good. So, when you hear something I say, or Al says, or someone else, seek the face of the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you are the perfect teacher. You're infallible Almighty. I surrender to you. Guide me into all truth. Show me where Sam is right. Show me where he's wrong. And if he's wrong, show him his error so he can correct it, because I don't want to be wrong. So if you've been told that, that believers were called Christians by unbelievers by way of mocking them, I challenge you to show me where Acts 11, 26 says that. Nowhere. This is another tradition 
that is not backed up by scripture. Nowhere in Acts 11, 26 are you told they were first called Christians by unbelievers by way of mockery. That myth must be set aside. That tradition must be discarded. No, unbelievers did not call the followers of Christ Christians by way of mockery. Nowhere in the scriptures are we told that. Acts 11, 26, prove me wrong. So Antioch, Syria is very influential because it was a hotbed of apostolic activity. You had apostles going there like Peter and prophets receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit would, were also present there. And who's the bishop of the church there? Ignatius, Ignatius. He wrote seven letters that have been preserved by the providence of God. Seven letters that God in his wisdom have preserved that Ignatius wrote as he was imprisoned by the Roman soldiers and on his way to Rome to be martyred, to be killed because he was going there to be fed to the lions. Those seven letters are translated. You can find them at newadvent.org. Some of the letters he's writing to churches that Paul wrote to because he's writing to the Ephesians. Well, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and we have that letter. And he's also writing to the Christians at Rome. Well, Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome. So some of the letters are actually written to churches that the apostles established and even wrote to. And in the letter to the Romans, Ignatius is begging the Christians there, if he's found favor with them, do not stop me from being martyred. Do not stop me from being killed. I want to die as a willing sacrifice for Jesus and offer my flesh as bread to God. He wanted to die and he begged the Romans or believers, don't intercede. If I found favor in your sight, let me die as a martyr for Jesus. That's how much they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They loved him so much that they wanted to die as martyrs for his glory, like Jesus died for them. Now, why is this witness important? Well, he's an eyewitness to the apostles. And he's appointed by them to be the bishop of Antioch, Syria, who's being sent to be martyred. And he was martyred. He was fed to the lions as a sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he have to say about the deity of Christ? What does he have to say about the Trinity. What does he have to say about Jesus being God in flesh, the God man? Well, let's read one of the articles, the links to which he gave you. It's titled, it's on my post, it's called Ignatius of Antioch's Proclamation of the Essential Deity of Christ. So we're going to read what he says in these seven letters. Now remember, these letters are dated between 107 and 112 AD. 107 to 112 AD. He's writing within 10 years of the death of the Apostle John. According to church tradition, Paul lived, I'm sorry, John lived all the way to the 90s AD, the dating, 90s AD. So he lived to be quite old, and he lived in the last de decade of the first century. So Ignatius is writing within 10 years of John's death. According to church tradition, the Apostle John was the only apostle that wasn't martyred. He died of old age. Just wanted you to know that. According to church tradition, all the other apostles, the 11, were martyred except John. Now, church tradition does say that John was thrown in boiling oil. He was thrown in boiling oil and he survived. Is that amazing? He survived. But anyway... And I have no reason to belie the tradition. I have no reason to reject the tradition as myth. Unless you have persuasive evidence showing the tradition that was passed on is not to be trusted, I have no reason to not trust it. Now, with that said, let's see what this man writes to these churches about the Trinity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here I'll be quoting from his epistle. And if he posts the link again, I link to the translations of his epistles on newadvent.org. This is the epistle to the Ephesians. So I'm all I'm be doing is reading. That's all I'm going to be doing. A lot of reading, and we'll wrap it up with Polycarp. Okay. Greeting. This is how it begins. Watch this. Ignatius, who's who is also called Theophorus. 
Theophorus, Theophorus, to the church was at, which is at Ephesus. Now remember, who wrote to Ephesus? Paul did. And one of the seven churches that the Lord Jesus instructs John to write to is the church at Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2. Right? If you read verses 1 to 7. There, it's directed to the church at Ephesus. So Ignatius is also writing to Ephesus. In Asia, deservedly most happy, being blessed in the greatness and fullness of God the Father. So notice, God the Father. Okay? And predestined before the ages of time, before the creation of time, that it should be always for an enduring and unchangeable glory, being united and elected through the true passion, the suffering, by the will of of the Father, and who else? And Jesus Christ, our God. Abundant happiness through Jesus Christ and his undefiled favor or grace. Now catch, the Father is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Father. And the Father is God, but so is Jesus Christ. Because notice, he says, Jesus Christ, our God. Now I provide for you the transliteration of the Greek. Because the Greek isn't just Jesus Christ our God. This is what it actually says. Tu theu hemon. Literally, Jesus Christ, the God of us. He calls Jesus ha theos or o theos. Tu theu is the genitive form of the words o theos. Literally, Jesus Christ, the God of us. Let that sink in. Before I move on, that sinking, guys. So Jesus isn't simply God; He's the God, and He is the God of us, right? So Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is God, but so is Jesus Christ, in that He is the God of us. But He's got more to say about Jesus. Chapter one: Praise of the Ephesians. I have. Oh, by the way, notice the happiness you enjoy, the joy of your salvation. The favor you receive only comes through Jesus Christ, through the medium, through the mediation, the intermediary agency of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? The happiness, the joy, the love and peace are only yours because of Jesus Christ and your union with him. These are not given apart from Christ. So you cannot be a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or agnostic and expect to be given the joy, the peace, the love, the happiness that comes from the true God. God will only confer these favors because of Christ, for the sake of Christ and your faithfulness to Jesus and your trust in him. Right? Oh, by the way, we've got this modalist heretic again spewing. Blasphemy is like the spiritual dog he is. One God, one Christ who will never call. In fact, I hope he Skypes us. Here, Skype me to see if you can defend your perversion of Colossians 2.9. These heretics don't even know English, let alone Greek. He thinks that when it says in the King James that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily, that means he's God the Father. Only a satanic pervert would misunderstand the word Godhead reading it from a 21st century perspective as opposed to trying to understand what it meant in the 7th century when the translators of King James used this term in the 7th century. Now, if this pervert doesn't call this Bible pervert, guys, get rid of him. Anyway, now with that said, let's continue. Chapter 1. Praise of the Ephesians. Praise of the Ephesians. I have, been, I have become acquainted with your name, much beloved in God which you have acquired by the habit of righteousness. Notice, your reputation precedes you. A reputation built on you being righteous and obedient to the Lord. According to the faith and love in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now watch this. Being the followers of God and stirring up yourselves by the blood of God. Whose blood? The blood of God. Echoing what Paul said to the Ephesians elders in Acts 20, 28. See, this tells you Canisius knows the theology and the theological terminology of the apostles like John and Paul. Because if you read Acts 20, 17 to 35, there Paul was at Melitus, which is also in Asia Minor in Turkey. And he summons for the elders of Ephesus, 
the Ephesian elders. And to the Ephesian elders, Paul says, be overseers, which the Holy Spirit has made you, to shepherd the flock, which is the church of God, that he purchased with his own blood. So there Paul says to the Ephesian elders, you have been appointed by the Holy Spirit to oversee the church of God, a church, a church which God purchased with his blood. And so who is Ignatius writing to? The Ephesian elders. And he's using terminology that they would already be familiar with because Paul already used that language earlier on before Paul was martyred. And he refers to the blood of God. Blood of God, God has blood, but God is spirit, John 4, 24. And Jesus as God, in relation to his divine nature, as God possessing the divine nature, that nature is spirit. It's immaterial. It's incorporeal. It's spaceless. So how can God, who is spirit, who doesn't have a material body, have blood? Because this God became flesh, flesh from the Holy Virgin, taking his blood from her. So here you have the two natures of Christ. The two natures of Christ. Now, let me explain. You know, you have Christians who want to sound intelligent, so they come up with fancy terms. This is known as the communicatio idiomatum. Communicatio idiomatum. Can you say that five times fast? Five times fast. What does that mean? The translation, it's a Latin phrase, two Latin terms. It means the fellowship, the fellowship, the communion, of the characteristics. What does that mean? Because Christ is one eternal person. He's an eternal divine person. He did not become a human person. He didn't become another person. He didn't become two persons. That's the heresy of Nestorianism. Christ is one eternal divine person. He didn't become a human person. As one eternal person, he took on the nature of humanity. So he's one eternal divine person who became a human being, but not a human person. So he has a physical body that he's now glorified. He has a human nature and all the characteristics of humanity with the exception of sin, but he's still one person. Because he's one person, you will find in both the New Testament and the writings of the church fathers that the characteristics of one nature will be ascribed to the other nature, for example, the blood of God. Well, blood refers to his human nature, but it's being attributed to him as divine, the blood of God. And you find that in the New Testament, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2 8, it says, Had they had they had they known, had they known the rulers of this age would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, Lord of glory is a divine title. It's a divine epithet. It refers to his deity. But they didn't crucify the deity, the divine nature, because the divine nature can't be crucified because it's not material, it's not physical, it's not tangible. They crucified the physical body of that divine person. They crucified him as a man in flesh. So... Here, you'll find in the New Testament and the church fathers, because Christ is only one person with two natures, they will speak of that one person and, and ascribe one set of characteristics that belong to one particular nature to the other nature. It is as a man that he can be crucified. It is as a man that he has blood. But they ascribe the characteristics of his human, humanity when speaking of him as God divinity the blood of god crucified the lord of glory and this is known as the communicatio idiomatum and you find the new testament writers doing this all throughout the new testament as well as in the church fathers i hope i didn't confuse people i'm trying to go slow and repeat myself more than once until it sinks in so does god have blood no so how could Ignatius referred to the blood of God because he knows that Jesus is truly God, but he, but he became man. And as man, he had blood that he shed. So it's the blood of God, that eternal divine person who became flesh. Did you want to say something, brother? 
No, I was going to say, if you want to just uh, repeat it again, if you feel like they need to uh, uh, grasp it, uh, feel free to do so. Yes. So like our brother Orthodox Apologetic Channel said, hypostatic union, the union of the two hypostases, meaning, well, here we're using hypostasis in a different sense. We have to be careful when we use language, and I don't want to confuse people. In the New Testament period, the word for hypostasis meant substance. And it's used in Hebrews 1.3, where it says Jesus is the exact representation of God's hypostasios, to butcher the Greek. Well, hypostasios is where we get the word hypostasis, hypostasis. Later on, the term hypostasis, hypostasis, <clears throat> came to mean the equivalent of what we mean by person. So we have three hypostases, hypostases in the Godhead, because there we're using it to mean person. But earlier on in the New Testament period, 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 you know, I'm tired. In the New Testament period, the word hypostases, Apostasis or hypostasios meant substance, nature. So when we talk about the hypostatic union, we have to be careful. We don't use the term hypostasis here to refer to person because there's only one person of Christ. So when we say the hypostatic union, there we're using the word hypostasis to mean the substance, substances, the natures, equivalent to phusis, right? Or usia. Christ has two natures, two substances, but he's one person. So communicatio idiomata means in the one person, there are two natures, two essences, divine nature, divine essence, human nature, human essence, and each nature has its own unique set of characteristics. But both sets of characteristics are perfectly united in one person, and they don't mix into each other or fuse into each other. You just got seminary level education right there, guys. Yeah. So I hope you understand. Another example of Jesus being spoken of in reference to his two nature, natures, even one nature, even though there's one nature in view. In John 6 62, he says, What if you see the Son of Man ascend? To where he came from. Notice John 6, 62. What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he came from before? Well, folks, he wasn't the Son of Man in heaven before he came down. The Son of Man refers to his humanity. That he appears as a man. He looks like a man because he became man when he took flesh from the Blessed Virgin. So he only became the Son of Man at his conception and birth from the Blessed Virgin. Prior to that, he wasn't actually the Son of Man. But notice what he said. What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he came from before? Well, he wasn't the Son of Man before he came down. But you see, again, he can speak of his humanity when he has his divine pre-human existence in mind. Because now he's going to go back up. Not just as God, but as God in flesh, as the God-man. Whereas when he came down, he came down as God. And he took flesh from the virgin. Now when he goes back up, he doesn't just go back up as God, but as God in flesh, the God-man who's now truly human with a physical body. Something he did not have when he came down. Right. And Daniel 7, of course, um, affirms what you just said. Yep. So there you go. A lot to unpack. That's why it's going to be more than one part. So... Notice Ignatius refers to Jesus as God who shed his blood. So that's the point. By the blood of God, you have perfectly accomplished the work which was beseeming to you. Let me read all of it. It's more we read all of it. Okay. For on hearing that I came bound from Syria, see, I was bound from Syria, for the common aim and hope, trusting through your prayers, you're going to pray for me, intercessory prayers, to be permitted. Look, I want you to pray that I fight the beast and let them devour me. He's not saying, through your prayers, I'll escape. I'm trusting you're going to pray for me to be martyred by the beasts at Rome. 
that so by martyrdom I may indeed become the disciple of him who gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Referring to Ephesians 5.2. You hasten to see me. I receive therefore your whole multitude in the name of God through Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love, and your bishop in the flesh. Now, by the way, if you don't know who Onesimus is, Onesimus is the runaway slave of Philemon. And you have that letter, Philemon, of only 25 verses. Not only did he become a believer when he met Paul, converting, giving his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, not only being freed by Philemon, he ends up becoming the bishop at Ephesus, right? Whom I pray you by Jesus Christ to love and that you would all seek to be like him, Onesimus. And blessed be he who has granted unto you being worthy to obtain such an excellent bishop. So what is Ignatius saying? I want to be like Jesus and I want to be kind of worthy of Jesus. And like Jesus who died, who was martyred, who died for our sins, I want to be like my Lord and be killed like my Lord and die as a martyr like my Lord so I can then attain to the glorification of my Lord. Okay, chapter 7. Here's chapter 7. Beware of false teachers. So beware of Al-Fadi. Just kidding. Don't hit, don't sell me. Okay, chapter 7. For some are in the habit of caring about the name of Jesus Christ in wicked guile. Notice, there are some who claim to be Christian, but they are liars and deceivers, while yet they practice things unworthy of God, whom you must flee as you would wild beasts. For they are ravening dogs. Where is the love, Ignatius? I don't say Jesus, and you how are you insulting people like that? Jesus said, love your enemy. And yet he calls them wild beasts and ravening dogs who bite secretly against whom you must be on your guard inasmuch as they are men who can scarcely be cured. Now watch this. Look what he says about our Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Pay attention, guys. Two natures, one eternal divine person. For there is one physician who is both possessed of flesh and spirit. So as a man, he's flesh. As God, he's spirit. Both made and not made. Wow. The Greek is genitos, ke agenitos. Literally, he's born and unborn. How can he be both born and unborn? Because as man, he was born. He was made of the virgin. As God, he's unborn, unmade, he's eternal. Notice the two natures. One physician, one person, two natures. God existing in flesh. True life and death. He became man and died. Both of Mary and of God, first passable, meaning he could die and pass away, and now impassable, immortal, even Jesus Christ our Lord. What council of Nicaea? What Nicene Creed? This is 107 AD, hundreds of years before Constantine and the council of Nicaea, and he's expressing the hypostatic union in the most explicit manner imaginable. And this is Ignatius, okay? Chapter 18. Uh, the people are asking about what do you mean by chapters? So if you want to uh, remind them again what you're looking yes. at right now. What do you mean by chapters? Guys, I just told you his letter to Ephesians, which is broken down in individual chapters. Yeah. Right? Yes. And uh, Mariana, when this Truth Defenders comes back, because I put him on timeout, please no, blame him. He's, no, he's uh, Truth Defenders. He's slime. I want you to know that. I just yeah. called him out the other day. He is a wicked rabid Calvinist who goes and slanders people behind their backs on YouTube channel. I called him out, and he was an acquaintance. I have had to block, and I've called this coward to call me on, on Skype. Guys, do not have anything to do with this guy, Lewis Lionheart, Truth Defenders. He's a wicked, vile, rabid slanderer, and his lust for Calvinism is such that he attacks other Christians and slanders them viciously, but he's not man enough to defend his doctrines. He's an armchair quarterback who sits back and attacks people in the comment section, but he will never dare debate anyone. So like Shabrali just debated Cobain, he'll be there criticizing the Christian, but he's not man enough to debate Shabrali, so he barks and he needs to be muzzled. So Louis Leinhardt, you know my Skype. Call me, tough guy, and defend your satanic doctrine of Tulip and... Prove that I worship Mary, because this is what he does. You need to avoid this guy. 
I put up with him for so many years. I'm done with him. Anyway, yeah. so and you know, brother, uh, I, I hate to say this, but uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, well-meaning Christians that uh, make these false accusations about uh, people worshiping Mary without <laughs> any knowledge about anything, unfortunately. But anyway, I mean, we're gonna have a lot of topics to hopefully do streams. Yeah, and brother, just for the record, not all Calvinists are rabid like him. This man is someone who claims to be a Christian. But he's not in submission to scripture because I know him personally. And I'll tell you how I know that. For the past 10 years that I've known him, he isn't a member of any church, doesn't submit to any pastor. Because to him, no church is good enough. No bishop is intelligent enough for him to submit to. That's his arrogance. He's one of those that scripture warns against that they're puffed up with knowledge, but do not know the Lord. And may God grant him repentance. But until then, avoid him. Don't give him a platform. He thinks because he bashes Islam and he goes out there and he has a table that he's doing Christ a favor and that he's a Christian serving the Lord. Yeah. The man is dangerous and I pray he repents. I really do. But until he does, avoid him. And my Skype is open for you because I would love nothing more than to put you in your place because you are a troll and you think you're doing the Lord a favor, but you're used of the devil to slander and you're not in submission to the Lord Jesus. Go find you a church and a pastor and submit to because you are alone with McQuaid and you're a danger to the body of Christ. So I had to call him out, brother. Yeah, no problem. I mean, uh, just, I just, I brought him up because uh, brother, this is my new strategy. If anyone in here, I, I mean, you could be a Christian, you could be a Muslim, you could be anything. If you're here and I notice you're attacking, insulting, you are a slandering. I have no tolerance for this whatsoever. And I will be removing you immediately because we have to be here to respect our guests. And we also respect each other. I called him out because I caught him yeah. like a snake behind my Sorry, guys. We don't mean to distract you, but we got to warn you of wolves. Yeah. I caught him. Unbeknownst to him, he was in a comment section where Kelly Powers was debating a oneness. And I wasn't even part of the conversation. Someone said, Magnificent Prophet, Sam Shamoon would destroy this oneness. And God exposed this wolf. Because you got it, it's God's timing that I happen to come in and he says, Well, Sam worships Mary and venerates the saints. I don't know who's worse. So, in other words, if you believe in communion of saints, which means the Catholics and the Orthodox, you're perhaps even worse than a oneness modalist who's an anti Trinitarian. See, this guy showed he's a wolf and he's not of the Lord because only a coward would pretend to be my friend when he's in my face and then attack me behind my back because he's not a man. He's of the devil until he repents. So avoid this troll. And my Skype is open for you, coward. Call me. Let's go live. But he knows better because he can't defend his wicked satanic doctrine of Tulip. And that's what it is. Thank God he saved me out of it. And I'm not angry. I'm speaking passionately and truthfully. He's, he's a troll. He's of the devil. May he repent because he's not of the Lord. Okay. Now, with that said, brother, uh, let's continue. Ready? I am. Do it. All right. So that's what just so now let's go to chapter 18, the glory of the cross. The glory of the cross. Let my spirit be counted as nothing for the sake of the cross. And by the way, it's ironic I mentioned Ignatius. Did you know Ignatius says you better submit to the bishop because the bishop represents Christ on, on earth? If you don't submit to the bishop, you are in rebellion to Christ. And yet this coward has no bishop that he's ever submitted to. Prove me wrong. I've known you for the longest time. Who is your bishop? What's his name? You have none. That means Ignatius would have thrown you out as a heretic in rebellion because you're not of the Lord. You're a wolf until you repent. It's ironic. I'm quoting Ignatius, who was a bishop, who was a disciple of the apostles. Beware of these wolves, brethren. And we just read about them, right? And their guile, they pretend to follow Jesus. Let my spirit be counted as nothing for the sake of the cross. Okay? Which is a stumbling block. To those that do not believe, but to us, salvation and life eternal. Where is the wise man? Where is the disputer? Where is the boasting of those who are styled prudent? For our God, Jesus Christ, was, according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb of Mary. So here you have appointment of God, God the Father, distinct from Jesus, who is our God, conceived in the womb of Mary, of the seed of David, by the Holy Ghost. There's the Trinity. God appointed Jesus Christ, who is our God, to be conceived in the womb of Mary, to be of the seed of David by the Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity working together in perfect union. You guys saw that? 
Genau. Let's go to chapter 19. And this is just from one epistle. I'm going to read several more epistles and wrap it up with Polycarp. We should be able to finish at least these two witnesses. Chapter 19. Three celebrated mysteries. Now, the virginity of Mary, and I love this, guys. Notice the wisdom of God in inspiring the prophets to record the prophecies in such a way that if you're not reading attentively with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss it. You won't see it. Now the virginity of Mary was hidden from the prince of this world, from Satan, as was also her offspring. And the death of the Lord, three mysteries of renown. So God in his wisdom inspired prophecy in such a way that Satan would not be able to understand the prophecies that the Messiah, God, would be born of a virgin and would be crucified to destroy the power of darkness. These were kept from the devil. Now, where is Ignatius getting this from? Is he making it up? No. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. What did Paul say? Had the rulers of this age known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they known that God in his wisdom was going to destroy the power of Satan and redeem people from Satan through Jesus' death on the cross, then Satan and his instruments would have done everything to stop Christ's, Christ from being killed on the cross. But they did not know that the crucifixion of our Lord, the cross, was the weapon of Christ to destroy their power because it was kept from them. That's where he's getting it from. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. So let's continue, okay? A star shone forth in heaven above all the other stars, the light of which was inexpressible, while its novelty struck men with astonishment. And all the rest of the stars with the sun and moon formed a chorus to this star, and its light was exceedingly great above them all. And there was agitation felt as to whence this new spectacle came. Where did it come from? The star that arose, signifying the coming of our Lord. So like to everything else in the heavens. Hence, every kind of magic was destroyed, and every bond of wickedness disappeared. Ignorance was removed, and the old kingdom abolished. God himself manifested in human form. Who? God himself manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. And now that took a beginning, which had been prepared by God. Henceforth, all things were in a state of tumult because he meditated the abolition of death. That was epistle to the Ephesians. Now, another epistle. His epistle to the Magnesians. Guys, watch. It's nothing yet. Just pay attention. Okay? Epistle to the Mag Magnesians. The Magnesians. Chapter 6. Preserve harmony. Preserve harmony. Since therefore <clears throat> I have, in the persons before mentioned, beheld the whole multitude of you in faith and love, I exhort you to study to do all things with a divine harmony while your bishop presides in the place of God. Wait. The bishop represents who? God to you. He's in the place of God watching over you. That means if you're a true Christian who follows sola scriptura, you're going to be in submission to the bishops that God has appointed. So when you find some arrogant, puffed-up jerk who has no bishop or church that he submits to, but runs his mouth in slander, this man is a tool of the devil. Avoid him until he repents. And hopefully, truth offender will repent because he's in rebellion to Christ. Okay? Along, look what it says, your presbyters... In the place of the assembly of the apostles, so they take the place of the apostles because the bishop represents God. The presbyters who are subject to them represent the apostles along with your deacons who are most dear to me and are entrusted with the mystery or the ministry of Jesus Christ. How long has Jesus existed? Who was with the Father before the beginning of time. So how old is Jesus? Timeless, because he was with the Father before time was created. So Ignatius, a disciple of the apostles, was taught this Jesus is eternal, uncreated, timeless, because he is with the Father. So notice, he's not the Father, destroying modalism. He was with the Father. He is not the Father, with the Father before time, so that Father and Jesus were there together 
in eternity before the creation of time. And in the end was revealed. In the end was revealed. Do all then, imitating the same divine conduct, pay respect to one another and let no one look upon his neighbor after the flesh, but continually love each other in Jesus Christ. Let nothing exist among you that may divide you, but be united with your bishop. You know what I'm getting at. And those that preside over you as type and evidence of your immortality. Chapter 7. Do nothing without bishop and presbyters, truth defenders, or truth perverter, truth butcherer. As therefore the Lord did nothing without the Father. The Lord did nothing without the Father. Being united to him. So notice this destroys modalism again. He's not the Father, but united to him. Neither by himself, nor by the apostles. So neither do anything without the bishop and presbyters. Neither endeavor that anything appear reasonable or proper to yourselves apart, but being come together into the same place, let there be one prayer, one supplication, one mind, one hope in love and in joy undefiled. There is one Jesus Christ than whom nothing is more excellent. Therefore, run together as into one temple of God, as to one altar, as to one Jesus Christ, who came forth from one father and is with and has gone to one. So he was there with the father in eternity, came forth and returned to him. Chapter 8. Caution against false doctrines. Be not deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables, which are unprofitable. For if we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. For the divinest prophets, the prophets who were inspired, lived according to Christ Jesus. Did you catch it? Ignatius says the Old Testament prophets were not saved by observing the law of Moses. It was revealed to them Jesus Christ would come to save them, and their hope and trust was in Jesus. That's what he's saying. The divinest prophets lived according to Christ Jesus because God revealed to them he's coming, and they eagerly awaited his coming. Their hope was in Christ. On this account also they were persecuted, being inspired by his favor, his grace, to fully convince the unbelieving that there's one God who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ, his son. So that father makes himself known by his son. So notice he's not the father. He's a father's son. And this son, who is his eternal word, not proceeding from, from silence, and in who in all things pleased him that sent him, destroying modalism and showing that Jesus is the Son of God there in eternity who became flesh. Now, here's another letter of Ignatius, the Epistle to the Romans. We're almost done. All I'm doing is reading him. Epistle to the Romans. Pay attention. Okay, watch here. Look what he says. Greeting, Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus, to the church, which has obtained mercy. Now watch the language, guys. Before Nicaea, the Joe's Witnesses and Unitarians hate these letters and try to say they're forgeries. Fraudulent, compiled later after its time, or later editors inserted these statements in the letters because they can't deal with the facts. Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus, to the church which has obtained mercy, through the majesty of the Most High Father and Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Did you guys catch it? Again, no modalism here. The Father is not the Son, and the Son, Jesus Christ, not the Father. His only begotten Son. Tu manu weyu autu. His one and only Son. The church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of Him that wills all things which are according to the love of Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ, Ignatius? Love of Jesus Christ, our God. The Greek is, guys, listen to the Greek. Jesus Christ, tu theu hemon. Tu theu, genitive of o theos. Literally, he just called Jesus, literally, the God of us. Who is our God? Our God is Jesus, and he's the God. Not a God, the God, tu theu. Right? So, Ignatius says Jesus is the God, O Theos, existing before time, who is unmade, who then became made. Man, born of the virgin, 
by the Holy Spirit, seed of David, two natures, one eternal, uncreated person, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Trinitarianism, hypostatic union, all in these letters. Wow. Which also presides in the place of the region of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of the highest happiness, worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy, and which presides over love, is named from Christ and from the Father, which I also salute in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. No modalism here. To those who are united, both according to the flesh and spirit, to every one of his commandments, inwardly and outwardly, we are united to Christ and obey his commandments, who are filled inseparably with the grace of God and are purified from every strange taint. And I pray I'm not too loud. I don't want to distract my neighbors. Please, my God. I wish abundance of happiness unblameably in who? Jesus Christ to Theo Hemon. To Theo Hemon in the dative. And who? In unity, Jesus Christ, the God of us. The God of us. To Theo Hemon in the dative. Again, he calls Jesus the God. Okay? Chapter 3 of his epistle to the Romans. Few more snippets, guys. Bear with me. And then we're going to finish up with Polycarp. Chapter 3 of his letter to the Romans. You who have never envied anyone, you who have taught others, now I desire that those things may be confirmed by your conduct, which in your instructions you enjoin other, others. Only request in my behalf both inward and outward strength that I may not only speak but truly will, not just be a hearer but a doer. And that I may not merely be called a Christian, but really be found to be one. You can call yourself Christian, truth defender, but you need to prove that you are one by obeying his commands. For if I be truly found a Christian, I may also be called one and be then deemed faithful when I shall no longer appear to the world. Meaning when I'm martyred, that will be proof I am truly a Christian. Nothing visible is eternal. This world is passing. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen eternal. He's quoting now 1 John 2, 15 to 17. For our God, Jesus Christ, now that he's with the Father, so note, he's our God, but he's not the Father. He's with the Father. Is all the more revealed in his glory. Christianity is not a thing of silence only, but also of manifest greatness. You got to prove your faith, your Christianity. Now watch what he writes to the Smyrnians. We're almost done. There's a few more snippets. This is his epistle to the Smyrnians. Chapter 1. Thanks to God for your faith. Watch this, guys. Get ready to be blown away. Get ready to be blown away. I glorify God, even Jesus Christ, who has given you such wisdom. Who is Jesus, who is Jesus Christ? Our God. And I give you the Greek. Doxaxo. Yesun Christun, Ton Theon, Jesus Christ, who is the God that I glorify. Notice again, he calls Jesus the God. Literally, the Greek is, I glorify Jesus Christ, the God, and it's Jesus Christ who is the God who made you wise. Yeah, and, and, and a definite article, by the way, in the Greek is extremely important because you literally define someone in this case. So, in fact, even Christ in, uh, in the New Testament is the Christ. Why? Or the Jesus sometimes. Why? Yeah. Because there are some other Jesuses. There are other Christs in the Bible. But we're talking about a very unique one, a specific one. Yep. A particular one. So, in the Greek says, Doxatso Yesun Christun, Ton Theon, Ton Theon, that's the accusative, O Theos. So, Jesus Christ, the God, Ton Hutas, Himes, Sophis Santa. He is the God, Jesus Christ is the God who made you wise. For I have observed that you are perfected in an immovable faith, as if you're nailed to the cross of Lord Jesus Christ. So here is Jesus being killed by the cross, confirming the crucifixion and death of our Lord. So, and we are crucified with him. We crucify the world, right, to ourselves, both in the flesh and the spirit, and are established in love through the blood of Christ. So here, Jesus shed his blood to redeem us, to purchase us. Being fully persuaded with respect to our Lord that he was truly of the seed of David according to the flesh. Allusion to Romans 1, 3, 8. So he is the God who makes us wise, who was killed on the cross, 
who purchased us by his blood, who is of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he has two natures here. And the Son of God, according to the will and power of God, that he was truly born of a virgin, was baptized by John in order that all righteousness might be fulfilled. Matthew 3, 15, alluding to that, by him. And was truly under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch, nailed to the cross for us in his flesh. Wow. Dying for us, rising to live. Seed of David, born of the virgin, by the Holy Spirit. Of the flesh, he's of the, of the seed of David. But he's the God and the Son of God according to the will of the Father. Wow, man. Two natures, one person. Hypostatic union. Vicarious death. Suffering. Resurrection. Immortality. Distinct from the Father, yet united to him. All of that in Ignatius. Of this fruit, we are by his divinely blessed passion that he might set up a standard for all ages through his resurrection hmm. to all his holy and faithful followers, whether among Jews or Gentiles, in the one body of his church. That was epistle to, epistle to Spurnans. Now, the epistle to Polycarp, another bishop, which we're going to conclude with in a minute. He's now writing to Polycarp, who's the bishop of Smyrna, and you'll know why that's important in a minute. Chapter 3, Exhortations. What does he say to, to this bishop? But not those who seem worthy of credit, but teach strange doctrines, right? Fill you with apprehension. Those who teach perverse doctrines, like Jesus only died for the elect. Don't let them trouble you and apprehend you. Stand firm. As does an anvil which is beaten. It is the part of a noble athlete to be wounded and yet to conquer. And especially we ought to bear all things for the sake of God that he also may bear with us. Now watch what he says about our Lord. Guys, notice the language. Be ever becoming more zealous than what you are. Wait carefully the times. Look for him who is above all time. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus transcends all time? Eternal. And invisible, who became visible for our sakes, impalpable and impassable, meaning you cannot affect him. You can't harm him, harm him as far as his divine nature is concerned, yet who became passable, who passed away when he became flesh and died, but then was raised on our account. And in every kind of way suffered for our sakes. So wait, this one who became passable and suffered, he's above all time? He's eternal and invisible, but became visible because he became flesh. So Jesus is timeless, eternal, beginningless. And who is this? Ignatius. And who's Ignatius? The disciple of the apostles. Now, the final paragraph from Ignatius. Chapter 8, Epistle to Polycarp. Let, our, let, our, let other churches also send to Antioch. Now watch this, and then we're going to end it with Polycarp. Inasmuch as I have not been able to write to all the churches, because I must suddenly sail from Troas to Neapolis, as the will of the emperor enjoins, I beg that you, as being acquainted with the purpose of God, knowing God's purpose, will write to the adjacent churches, that they also may act in like manner, act like us, right? Such as are able to do, so sending messengers and the others transmitting letters through those persons who are sent by you, that you may be glorified by a work which shall be remembered forever, just like we're remembering him till this day, 2,000 years later, and we are remembering Polycarp, right? As indeed you are worthy to be. I salute all by name, and in particular the wife of Api, Apitropus, with all her house and children. I salute Atalus, my beloved. I salute him who shall be deemed worthy to go from you into Syria. Grace shall be with him forever and with Polycarp that sends him. Grace with Polycarp, who's going to send this man to accompany me. I pray for your happiness forever in our God, Jesus Christ. In who? In union with who? For the sake of who? Because of who? Our God, Jesus Christ. By whom? Continue in the unity and under the protection of God. I salute Elsie, my dearly beloved, farewell in the Lord. So not only is Jesus our God, but notice again, this happiness is only yours. The joy, the peace, the love, the, the favor, the mercy are only yours 
in union with Christ, for the sake of Christ, because of Christ, when you believe in him. And who is Christ? Our God. End of story. And then Ignatius makes it to Rome, and he is torn to shreds by lions, willfully so, eagerly wanting to be martyred and killed by the lions, and he died as a holy martyr. Who? Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, Syria, the place where they were first called Christians, an eyewitness of the apostles. And what did you find in his letters? The Trinity, the two natures of Christ. Jesus is not the Father. He's not the Spirit. Jesus is above time, unmade, unbegotten, timeless, eternal, transcends time, was with the Father before time, is not the Father, the Father's Son, who is the seed of David, born of the Virgin, became flesh by the Spirit. Two natures, one person, Trinity, who died, was killed by crucifixion, raised immortal, and dwells with the Father and will appear again. All of this theology in the seven letters of Ignatius, written around 107 to 112 AD. Wow. Now, brother, we have one more letter. Now, if you want to share the link again with them, guys, here's the link. I'll give it to them again. All of this in my post. I gather all these citations for your benefit in my post. And if you want to share it one more time, take these materials, upload them, study them, teach on them. Now we're going to conclude with Polycarp. Polycarp, and I won't quote much. This article that he's going to share the link to, the title is, Does Jesus Receive Latruo? Latruo. Now, why is that important? In Matthew 4, verse 10, and Luke 4, verse 8. Matthew 4, verse 10. Brother Paul, I can't be a bishop of a church. I'm not qualified. And I wouldn't take that honor because the highest honor and the greatest responsibility you can have on, on this earth is to be a bishop of the church of Jesus Christ. You can't take that position lightly because you will be judged more severely and harshly if it's not your calling to be a bishop and you misuse that office for selfish gain, God will punish you severely. I'm in submission to the church, and I have bishops watching over me, but I am not qualified to be a bishop, and I would not take that upon myself because I already have enough sins to account for. I don't need to add more. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on me and empower me to just be a Bible teacher under the authority of bishops, Serving the Lord if he wants me to until I die. So now with that said, this article is important for you guys to study. Because in Matthew 4 verse 10 and Luke 4 verse 8. Matthew 4 verse 10 and Luke 4 verse 8. Jesus rebuked the devil saying, away from me Satan, get thee hence Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Only serve him. He's referring to Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, where the Greek version of the Hebrew, the Greek version of the Hebrew says, God alone rece receives latruo. 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 There's another word used for service called du duleo. 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 Duleo means to serve, to slave. Latruo is the type of service, the type of worship that can only be given to God. And Jesus says, God alone receives Latruo. Now, for the Catholics here, you will know this because in Catholic understanding, and the Orthodox would agree, you have degrees of honor and veneration. You have duleo in Latin, dulia, and you have latruo in Latin, latria. Duleo can be the kind of service that you give not just to God, but to others out of your love for God. In the scriptures, we're exhorted, exhorted. for example, in Galatians 5, 6, Galatians 5, 13, Paul exhorts believers to serve one another in love. Faith being expressed in love and that love being expressed in service. Galatians 5.13. So there is a type of service, duleo, that's not worship given to God, but a service we do for one another 
out of our love for God, which God expects us to do, right? But then there's la troll. That is the worship given only to God. Catholics are already familiar with these distinctions because in Catholic understanding, you have latria, Latin for latruo. You have dulia, Latin for duleo. So duleo can be given to saints, honor saints for the lives that they live by the power of the Holy Spirit and sacrifice to God. And they also have what's called hyperdulia, which is an intense form of honor given to the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But latruo, latria is given only to God. And Jesus says that. Now, if it can be shown that Jesus receives latruo, that means he must be God because only God is to receive latruo. This service, this worship given only to God. Keep that in mind. It's all in that post, all in that article. All the details that I shared is in that post, in that article. If you can demonstrate from the god breathed scriptures, Jesus receives latruo in Greek, la, latria in Latin, then that means he is God because only God is to receive this kind of honor. Now, how does this tie in with Polycarp? And why is Polycarp important? Well, let me give you a little history of Polycarp. Polycarp was an eyewitness of the apostles. He was a disciple of the apostles, particularly John. He is the bishop of Smyrna. And he too, like Ignatius, died willfully as a martyr for Jesus at the age of 86. You'll find on new newadvent.org a letter describing his martyrdom. It's titled, The Martyrdom of Polycarp. At the age of 86, he was given the option, recant Jesus and be spared, or continue to worship Jesus and refuse to worship the gods and goddesses of the pagans and be burned alive. And you know what he said? 86 years I have served the Lord Jesus and he's been nothing but good to me. He's been good to me. How can I deny him? He chose to be burned alive at the age of 86 instead of denying Jesus. And you want to tell me someone like truth defenders can hold a candlestick to these holy men of God? Men who knew the apostles, men who lived holy lives and died as martyrs. Some clown like this guy wants to put himself in their league. A bishop appointed by the apostles. The arrogance of even think we're on their level. Now, in comparison to Jesus, they were maggots. They were not good enough to kiss Jesus' sandals. Though they were maggots, in comparison to us, we're not good enough to even be mentioned in their company and carry their sandals. These were great, holy, spirit-filled servants of Jesus who died as martyrs, who were the guardians of the faith, bishops of the church, who knew the apostles. Okay? Don't insult Nats. He's worse than a Nat, this truth butcherer and perverter. Now, with that said, to make, make it even more astonishing who this man is, he was martyred a decade after, several decades after, John, right around 120, 130, around there. That means when John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write to the seven churches in Revelation, if you see who these seven churches were, one of them was the church at Smyrna. If you read Revelation 2 and 3, there were seven churches, only two were blessed and remained faithful. The other five were faltering and falling away and being warned by the Lord, you better get yourselves in order or I'm going to remove you. The two churches that remained faithful, whom the Lord Jesus praised by name, was Philadelphia and Smyrna. When John wrote to the church at Smyrna, if we go with the traditional dating, 90-95 AD, that means the bishop that he was writing to was none other than Polycarp. And Jesus is telling John to write to that church who has Polycarp as the bishop. You're a church that I honor, that has honored me, and have maintained faithfulness, and I see nothing wrong with you. And interestingly, it's a church of martyrs. That means John 
by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would be writing to Polycarp and a church in Smyrna and praising him and, and his church. That's who Polycarp is. That's who Polycarp is. Now let me write, let me read what he says about Jesus. I'm going to read two English translations of his words. It's in that article. Let me read the one that's on newadvent.org. The epistle to the Philippians. Now notice he's writing to a church that Paul wrote to. The epistle to the Philippians chapter 2. An exhortation to virtue. Now pay attention. What he says about Jesus. Polycarp. May we be like Polycarp and Ignatius who try to be like the apostles, who try to be like Jesus, and live holy lives like them. And they did not believe in such things as tulip. Sorry, Calvinist, I don't mean to offend you, but I'm not going to tickle your ears. I too were like, was like you. I believed it, but God brought me out of it. Glory to the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. That doesn't mean they're not my brothers. They're still my brothers, but I hope you come to the fullness of the truth. Look what he says. Polycarp, and I quote, Wherefore, girding up your loins, he's now... Alluding to 1 Peter 1.13, Ephesians 6.14. Serve the Lord in fear and truth. As those who have forsaken the vain, empty talk and error of the multitude. And believed in him, God the Father, who raised up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. So notice again, no modalism here. God the Father is not Jesus. God the Father raised up our Lord Jesus from the dead. Now watch what he says about Jesus, guys. And gave him glory. God the Father gave jesus glory and a throne at his right hand so god the father resurrected jesus so jesus is not the father glorified jesus and gave him a throne next to the father at the father's right hand now watch what he says about jesus watch to him all things not some things in heaven and on earth are subject him every Spirit serves. That word serve is latruo. He comes as the judge of the living and the dead. So is he talking about Jesus? Because he's the one coming, not the father to judge the living and the dead. His blood will God require of those who do not believe in him. So who is he saying all things are subject to and every spirit serves? The one who shed his blood and who's coming to judge the living and dead. Jesus Christ. But he, God the Father, who raised them up from the dead, will also raise us up if we do his will. Wait, wait, wait. What? If we do his will and walk in his commandments? Wait, what? So true faith, sola fide, the true faith that saves is faithfulness. Trusting Jesus, taking him at his word, and being faithful to do what he commands. That is what sola fide it truly is. Being faithful to the Lord, that is faith. And if you do his will, walk in his commandments, love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witness, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, or blow for blow, or cursing for cursing, but being mindful of what the Lord said in his teaching, judge not, so even knows the Gospels, that you be not judged. Forgive, and it shall be forgiven unto you. Be merciful, that you may obtain mercy. With what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you again. And once more, blessed are the poor and those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Wow, he's saturated with the books of the New Testament. He knows Matthew and Luke, and he knows First Peter and Philippians, and he refers to them and alludes to them and quotes directly from them. Notice how much Bible they knew. And what did he say about Jesus? Jesus died, shed his blood. God the Father raised him up. So he's not the Father. He's the Father's Son. And the Father glorified him. So he sits on a throne next to the Father's right side. And this Jesus will come to judge living and the dead. And this is the Jesus that every spirit gives latruo to. Latruo in the Greek. Now, let me read another version. Let me read another version, and we're done. This is, again, same letter, the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, chapter 2. But now I'm quoting Michael W. Holmes, who is 
a patristic scholar, a scholar of the church fathers, in his translation, and I have it in my library right now, of the apostolic fathers, pages 207, 209. Now, in his volume, he gives you the Greek, where you can see the Greek, and he gives you the English translation. Notice his translation. Therefore, prepare for action and serve. See, again, true faith that saves is a faith that's active. It's faithfulness to do what God tells you to do. And what's the word here for serve? It's duleo. Dueli, I'm sorry, dueli usati. Dueli usati. Dueli usati. Duale siati. God and fear. Serve God in fear and truth. Leaving behind the empty and meaningless talk and the air of the crowd and believing in him who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand. Now watch. To whom, Jesus, all things in heaven and earth will, were subjected, whom every breathing creature serves. What's the word serve? La tri uie. La tri uie. La tri uie from la truo. So every creature that breathes gives Jesus la truo. The very worship that Jesus says is to be given only to God. Every breathing creature shall and must and eventually will do so on the day of judgment. If they don't do it now, on the day of judgment, they will do it. If they don't do it now. Give Jesus la truo an acknowledgement of who he is, who is coming as judge of the living and the dead. For whose blood God will hold responsible those who disobey him. Brother, let me just give you this if you can post it so they can see. And we're done. Here it is. And that article, guys, here you go. You can now post that. I don't think I can. Maybe I can. You see it? There you go. Polycarp Ignatius, disciples of the apostles, bishops, holy martyrs who died as holy, spirit-filled servants of Jesus, Woefully, because they love Jesus more than this life. And both of them affirm Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is flesh, and he died, shed his blood to redeem us. And God the Father glorified him by resurrecting him from the dead, where he now sits in throne at the right hand of God the Father on a throne, and all creatures are subject to him, and whom every thing that breathes must give Jesus la truo, either now willfully or unwillfully when he comes to judge living in there, because then he will subjugate you and bring you beneath his feet where you will be forced to acknowledge who he is, but it'll be too late then for salvation. So better be saved and trust in him now because on the day he comes, you will worship him. Do it now. Don't wait for that day. Christ is risen, risen indeed. So brother, there you go. Amen. And what kind of application you want him to get out of also Polycarp? Well, obviously, not only Polycarp, but Ignatius. Did you read what he said? If you are true Christians, true Christians, then you won't just be Christian by name. Remember what Ignatius said. I don't just want to be called a Christian. I want to prove to myself I'm a Christian by doing what the Lord commands and then living up to that name. So for these Christians who knew the apostles, who were appointed by the apostles, who followed the apostles, who tried to live holy lives and died as martyrs, not only did they worship and glorify the triumph God, they knew the Father wasn't the Son, and the Son wasn't the Spirit, and the Spirit wasn't the Father. And they knew that Jesus is eternal God who became flesh, two natures, one person. These holy slaves of the Lord exhorted everyone, if you're a Christian, you'll obey the Lord, you will serve the Lord, you will shun evil and sin, and cultivate holiness and righteousness, proving that you are truly a Christian and not someone who gives lip service, because giving lip service saves no one. And they died as martyrs to prove that they sought to be more than people who said they were Christian, but proved it by their actions, and may the Lord Jesus make us like them. And one final thing, I want to exhort you from Ignatius. You can, you can ignore him to your peril. Ignatius in his letter says, the bishop of every church stands in the place of God in Christ. God the Father, Jesus Christ, by the Spirit, has appointed a bishop in every church to rule you on behalf of God. Underneath him are presbyters, elders, who are like the apostles. They are likened to the apostles, 
and the bishops likened to God, and underneath the presbyters are deacons. And he says, you, laity, better submit to the bishop as the presbyters submit to the bishop and the deacons submit to the presbyters. So you submit to the bishop as if he's God and the presbyters as if they're the apostles and the deacons. Otherwise, if you don't submit, then you're not a Christian. You're in rebellion and the Lord Jesus will rebuke you. And I want to say to my Protestant brothers, you who think you're Christian but are not in submission to any solid bona fide church, you who think you're doing Jesus a favor by going on YouTube channels, slandering Christians, mocking Christians, <clears throat> bearing false witness, but you yourself haven't set foot in a church for over 10 years and haven't submitted, you're not a Christian. You're a tool of the devil. You're a liar when you say you believe the Bible. Because if you believe the Bible, you'll do what it says. And the Bible tells you, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves and submit to your leaders. Hebrews 10, 23, 25, Hebrews 13, 17. So I want to know who's your bishop? What's the church that you're in submission to that holds you accountable? You fake. Repent and fear the Lord before it's too late. Until then, shut your mouth. Don't come on any comment section and don't teach. You're not qualified. That's my final exhortation. All right, brother. Well, um, who else uh, would you like us to cover next time uh, from the Church Fathers? Or which doctrines uh, would you like us we, to cover? We can go on to Justin Martyr if you want. He's another one. And then we can go to Tertullian and we can then go into Arrhenius. But let's do Justin Martyr next. Still on Christology, of course. Yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. We'll be in touch, of course, you and I in the next few days. And we will continue with this series. Hopefully, everyone is enjoying it. We encourage you, of course, uh, everyone to really uh, re-watch this. Uh, that's my advice since this is deep stuff. You have the articles already. Take notes. But most importantly, and I think Sam would agree with me, we're not just teaching it here just for show. We hope that you would use it. You would use it. You would witness to others. You would witness to those who are misinformed. And you would witness to Muslims, for instance, who assume that whatever we believe in somehow was progressively invented at a later time. You know, speaking of Muslims whose Islam actually progressively advances, uh, we need to go back to what they call the Salaf. This is our Salaf, by the way, right here. They don't teach us to go and fight, actually. They teach us to go and serve and die for our Lord. That's that's Amen. the big difference between the two. Yep. So with that in mind, brother, thank you so much. Uh, are you doing any no, live? not tonight. Uh, not tonight, but Lord willing, sometimes this week. Let's see. I was trying to do a response of Greg Stafford, but we had a Christian who did not follow the rules, messed it up, and I had to delete it. So let's see if God will refresh me and revive me because Greg Stafford needs to be completely decimated. So I've already done a thorough job, but I wanted to just finish it off. But sadly, as Christians, we need to be alert and awake to Satan's schemes because Satan will also cause Christians, tempt Christians, to be used inadvertently by him. He can't control you and possess you if you belong to the Lord, but he can distract you and try to tempt you. And then if you're not alert and awake to his schemes, fall for his trap and be used as a distraction. And sadly, that's what happened. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on us. May the Lord Jesus give us patience. Pray for our family. Pray for his family. Pray for my daughters. Pray for their mother to give her life to the Lord completely. Pray for our health to stay healthy, that I stay fit and healthy. Pray for our holiness to truly love the Lord and do pray for the support because we're both in full-time ministry. If the Lord wants to use us, may he continue to support us to do this work for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to encourage everyone to consider to subscribe to our brother, supporting him through Patreon or PayPal. And also we pray that you will consider to do the same thing for us, especially PayPal. Uh, I mean, especially Patreon. Uh, it's very difficult really to maintain, uh, you know, the supporters on a monthly basis. So yeah. I'm always encouraging people to consider at least uh, becoming a patron, even for a short period of time, maybe for one year. Uh, I mean, the Lord will always provide. So thank you again in advance for uh, you guys' support for my brother, his channel, my channel, and others as well. We uh, we want to really be a blessing to all the brothers and the sisters uh, in the field. And uh, we want to just put aside uh, whatever issues uh, and whatever differences, because we're all servants of the Lord here. Mm -hmm. And we pray blessings upon uh, the body. And we pray for our Muslim friends who are watching this to uh, be encouraged 
and be at least uh, advised to go and research this kind of material because someone made a comment here which I agree with our Muslim friends of course tend to quote uh, uh, you know sources like Gnostic sources or heretical sources and claim that that's what Christianity is all about that's not true actually we want them to go and read for themselves what the church fathers that very early you know generation to the apostles and to Christ uh, how they also perceive the doctrines, the essential doctrines that we believe in. Sam gave you a number of articles here. These links will have sources in them that you can go and investigate. So we encourage all of you to do so. Very quickly about the Gnostics. If the Gnostics are true Christians, that means even Islam is false and Muhammad is a fraud. Why? The Gnostics, they were influenced by Greek philosophy that thought matter was evil. Their debate wasn't whether Jesus is divine. They actually thought Christ was truly divine. And because he's truly divine, he would not become flesh. Because to become flesh means he would taint himself because matter is evil. So Jesus, who is truly divine, truly deity, either only appeared in a body that wasn't real, or there was a human Jesus that the divine Christ entered and then left him when he was killed on the cross. If that's Christianity, that means Muhammad is a fraud. Either way, Muhammad is a fraud, and he, re he really is. Amen. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our moderators and those of you who are from Australia. We want to wish you a happy and blessed Australia Day tomorrow. All right, brother. God bless you. God bless you, everybody. This is Al-Fadi over now.